Hey, welcome to 12 Tone. In 1976, Kansas was wrapping up rehearsals for their fourth album, Left Overture, when on the final day, as they were packing their gear to relocate to the recording studio, guitarist Carrie Livgren brought in a new song he'd written the night before. Now, Kansas was in a bit of a rough state. After three albums, they'd toured with many of the biggest bands of the time and seen a fair amount of play on album-oriented rock stations, but they'd failed to really break through with a commercial hit. They knew Left Overture was going to be their last chance, and while they weren't enthusiastic about learning a new song so late in the process, they they saw potential in Livgren's last-minute edition. They took a risk and included it on the album, and that one decision changed their entire career. As you might have guessed, the song Livgren made Kansas learn on that fateful morning in Topeka would go on to become their biggest hit, Carry On Wayward Son. Let's take it apart. The song starts like this. Carry on my wayward son. So let's talk about harmonized acapella intros, because they seem to occupy a pretty weird space in the world of classic rock. Like, they don't happen very often, but the songs that do them tend to be among the most beloved works by their artists. Most famously, there's Bohemian Rhapsody, but you also see it in You Give Love a Bad Name, Nowhere Man, Songs from the Wood, and I've Seen All Good People. There's something about a harmonized acapella intro that lets it serve as an effective shorthand for pay attention, this is gonna be a good one. So why is that? Well, for starters, it's not easy. When you're singing without accompaniment, you don't have a consistent external reference pitch, so if you're not careful, you tend to drift out of tune. And when you add harmonies on top of that, those imperfections start to pile up unless everyone's listening really closely to the people around them. A well-executed harmonized acapella intro requires significant vocal and musical skill. On the flip side, these intros tend to use fairly basic harmonization techniques, most often tight harmony where all the voices move in the same basic shape. This lays out a clear roadmap for your listener to sing along with, so you have something that's both hard to do and easy to follow. That's a perfect storm for audience engagement. But perhaps more importantly, these sorts of intros are unusual. Form in rock music is a really complex topic and I don't want to get too deep into it here, but in general, the most common way to start a rock song, especially one from the 70s, is with an instrumental intro. It gives you time to acclimate to the music before the story begins. A harmonized a cappella intro, on the other hand, takes you from 0 to 60 right away, and that bold, in-your-face sound grabs your attention specifically because it's not conventional. It's a rare spice, you tend to see it maybe once per album, usually on a song that's also experimenting in other ways. It's a quick marker that this one's going to be different, and in music, different tends to be memorable. We'll talk more about what exactly these vocals are doing when we get to the chorus, but first we need to talk about guitar riffs, because honestly, Carry On Wayward Son is just six guitar riffs in a trench coat pretending to be a real song. And I say that with love, because they're very good guitar riffs. Like, check this out. <laughs> Oh boy, lot to talk about here. Let's start with metric displacement. The riff starts with this motif, and then three beats later, we hear it again. Or, okay, technically the last note is different, but it's the same rhythm and the same contour, so it comes across as the same basic shape. But Phil Ehart's drums make it pretty clear we're in 4-4, so repeating that shape after only three beats changes its metric position. We've gone from starting on the downbeat to starting on the backbeat. This shifts the emphasis, so while the first time we're focusing on the beginning, the second time we're listening for the end. By displacing the motif to a different beat, they've changed the experience of hearing it. But we're not done with a meter just yet. If you've listened to the song, you may have found yourself feeling a little uncomfortable with this riff, like it's slightly off balance, and there's a good reason for that. It's three bars long. In Western music, we mostly divide rhythms up into multiples of two. That's especially true for higher level rhythmic structures like the number of bars in a phrase or the number of phrases in a section. We hear these groups of two so often that they begin to just feel natural, and when we don't get them, it can be jarring, even if you can't quite put your finger on why. I think it's particularly interesting here because they sort of hide that inconsistency with the metric displacement. They're already playing around the bar line, so it's not as obvious that it's the wrong length. This creates just enough cover for the uneven meter to feel exciting rather than confusing. It feels like it's moving in slow motion. And finally, let's talk notes. In this first motif, we start by doing a lower neighboring tone to emphasize the root, and then we jump up. The second time, we jump a little higher to give ourselves this triumphant rising trajectory, building our way up, but then it gets impatient and starts walking straight to the top. He makes it almost all the way to the octave, but at the last second, he suddenly tumbles back down. This calls to mind one of the song's most iconic lyrics, I was soaring ever higher, but I flew too high. It's the story of Icarus laid out on guitar. That shape covers the first two bars while the third has these big drops. <laughs> The first one's a perfect fifth, dropping just below the root, but the second... 
is weird. Up to now, we've exclusively been playing notes from the minor pentatonic scale, which isn't surprising. Minor pentatonic and its cousin the blues scale are the vocabulary of rock riffs. I mean, not exclusively. Plenty of songs use other notes and scales, but minor pentatonic is the default. And with good reason. It's the minor scale without the difficult notes, so it kind of just works. You can play these notes in any order with any rhythm, and it'll probably sound pretty good. For most of the riff, that's exactly what they've been doing, but this F sharp isn't in a minor pentatonic. Heck, it's not even in a minor at all. It's the major sixth. So what gives? Well, the thing about minor pentatonic is that while it's safe, it's also limited. If you remove all the weird intervals, you're left with nothing weird to do, and weird stuff is cool. So while minor pentatonic is the default, it's not uncommon to see a couple extra notes, especially in accented positions. And that may seem counterintuitive. Surely the accented notes are where it's most important to reinforce the tonality, right? Well, not quite. Again, consider the purpose of these added notes. They're spice. Dropping a sudden major sixth in a minor progression changes the emotional character, but it only works if you notice it. Like, if I take that walk down and add a sharp four... Can you honestly say it made a difference? Did that feel more impactful? Because to me it barely even registers. But if I replace this F sharp with an E... It's drastic, and for my money, worse. The use of an unexpected major interval at the end of a descending minor line feels like you've fallen and then you stand up, dust yourself off, and, well, carry on. It's a little touch of hope to keep the song going. It also serves as a useful pivot point to bring us into the second riff, where a lot of things change. Let's start with the most obvious. We've switched to a triplet groove. Instead of dividing each beat into two eighth notes, it's split in three. Triplet grooves have a more laid back vibe, and while I wouldn't call this relaxed, it certainly feels more open than the first riff. There's a lot of space in it that you can really sink into. It's also only two bars long, releasing the metric tension from the first riff. But it's not completely different. There's still the same metric displacement, it's just a little harder to see. On beat one, we hear a single note played with a syncopated rhythm. And they hang on that until beat four, where they play a full chord with the exact same pattern. Once again, we have an emphasis on beats one and four, tying the two riffs together ever so slightly. We've also changed tonal centers. I don't want to say we've changed keys, because that feels a bit dramatic, but this section is centered pretty heavily around E, the fifth of our home key of A minor. They even go so far as to play it in E minor pentatonic which you can tell because it includes a B instead of a C. This harmonic relocation provides some contrast, and because E isn't really a stable point in our home key, the section doesn't feel stable either. It feels like a rubber band pulled tight and is ready to snap back at any moment. When it finally does, we get a solo over our first riff in A blues, and then a return to the second riff, but this time he plays a screechingly high E where the chords were. <laughs> And these two sections showcase another important part of building a song out of riffs. You have to evolve them. I mean, this is true for any song, but I think with riffs it's particularly easy to get stuck playing them the exact same way every time, and that gets boring. Reinterpreting the riff by adding these extra layers helps keep things fresh and exciting. Each return also brings something new. From there we get another... riff? I don't know if it really counts as a riff, but like, this thing. <laughs> Rhythmically, it's a play on the triplet groove, using slower quarter note triplets instead for more drama. Note-wise, though, it's doing something interesting. The top note is clearly rising, going from A to B to C, but the chords are moving in the other direction. If we listen to Dave Hope's bass... The roots have a clear downward trajectory. These contrary walking lines create a really satisfying sense of arrival, carrying us from A to G to F, so even though F isn't our root, we get to settle in for a moment on a nice comfortable major chord as we transition into the verse. Honestly, these next couple sections feel like an intermission to me. And I don't mean that in a bad way. The riffs are intense, and adding some calmer interludes is an effective way to prevent your audience from getting overwhelmed by them. But I do feel like that's the main purpose these sections serve, at least for me. It's a break from the action, and we see that in the musical structure. Instead of riffs, we get this fairly sedate chord progression, where we float from A minor down to F and then back up. It's a calm, smooth sound with no sudden leaps or striking chords. All the harmonic motion is nice and even. They do that twice, then bring the whole thing up a perfect fourth. 
This is a pretty common trick in guitar-based music, because you can just move everything you're playing up a string. It creates a new harmonic location without changing the underlying structure, so you get motion without disruption. In this case, though, it also creates something a little weird. We were walking up and down in whole steps, which worked fine when we were starting on A, but when we move to D, this same walk down puts us on a B-flat chord, which isn't in the key. This creates a sort of tension that underlines the lyrics that appear here. In each verse, the third line feels a little bit more desperate than the rest of them, and that's partly because it's trying to stabilize over this B-flat chord. And they're pretty clearly aware of that, too. For most of the verse, each chord gets two beats, but here they add this rhythmic figure at the end to extend and emphasize the alien B-flat. On the fourth line, though, they get rid of it, replacing it with a G chord they hold for a full bar to set up a return to A. As for Steve Walsh's melody, the notes are mostly just walking up and down in chord tones, but I do want to talk about the overall shape because it's got this beautiful, long, flowing phrase structure. Each of the four phrases is different, and each one sets up the next to create a single extended melodic journey. In each one, there are three notes that I want to highlight. The first note, which we hear on beat two of the first bar, the central note, a mid-phrase accent on beat one of the second bar, and then the last note, which moves around a bit, but it's the last one it shouldn't be too hard to identify. In the first phrase, Once I rose above the note, Noise and confusion. These notes are A, A, and B, staying roughly as still as you can over these moving chords in order to establish the root. In the second phrase, Just to get a glimpse beyond this illusion. We've got A, E, and D, the melody is starting to open up more. These are the three primary notes of the key, so if the first phrase establishes the root, the second one reinforces it. We're seeing more motion, but we're sticking to strong, powerful tones. In the third phrase, I was soaring ever higher two things happen. First, our target notes are now F, E, and D. This is a shift up in range to match the shift in the chords, but it also puts us on our first real color tone. F is the flat 6 of the key and the flat 3 of the underlying D minor chord. It carries a sense of emotionality to it that makes the sign feel more poignant and sad than the previous ones. Notice also the change in direction. The first line trended slightly up, the second took a big upward leap, but this one's starting high and walking down. That change points us toward a conclusion, telling us the phrase structure is going to end soon. Before it does, though, the other thing I want to highlight is that the lines are getting shorter. For the first two, the last note was on beat four of the second bar, but here it's been pulled forward to beat two. This makes room for the rhythmic figure in the harmony, and putting it right next to that central note also increases the sense of urgency. Time is running out. That gets even more intense in the final phrase. But I flew too high where our last note is on beat one, pushing the central note to beat four of the first bar. Or maybe it's beat three, I don't know, this three note model kind of falls apart on this last line because both these notes are accented. We're basically doing an abridged version of that F, E, D walk down from the third phrase, then suddenly dropping all the way down to G to set up a return to the start. Looking at all these lines together though, I do think it's important to recognize that none of them end on A. It's our root, the point we want to come back to, but every time we're left hanging, waiting for it to come. It always seems like there's a little bit further to go. And speaking of urgency, there's one last thing I want to mention in the verse. In the second half, the band comes in, and the tempo speeds up significantly. It's easiest to hear in the isolated vocals. Compare this Noise and confusion. to this. Still was a blind man. When I was younger, this always felt awkward and sloppy to me, and honestly, it still kind of does, but it also adds this raw, frenetic energy that I do think serves the song. In a 2017 interview, rhythm guitarist Richard Williams described the chaotic experience of recording Carry On. Livgren wrote it too late for the band to rehearse, so they mostly learned to play it in the studio, and they didn't have much time. In Williams' words, The version that you hear is probably the first time that we actually got it right. They were putting it together as they went, and that frantic productivity comes across in the music. The acceleration may be jarring, but it feels natural, a little mistake that provides some insight into the very human process of making an album. Anyway, this brings us to the chorus. The chords are reminiscent of the verse, but they've added an extra C chord here to create a more dynamic contour with more different kinds of motion. But I promised I'd talk about the vocals, so let's do that. Because of the tight harmonies between Walsh and backup singer Robbie Steinhardt, it doesn't really feel like there's a single melody. Like, I think Walsh's high part is the easiest to pick out, but they all blend together, so the overall effect is more like a melodic contour without a clearly defined range. As such, I'm not going to be talking about note choices, it's mostly just chord tones anyway, but I do want to highlight the overall shape. Unlike the verse, the chorus phrases are mostly the same, so let's just look at the first one. Carry on my wayward son. 
Here we have another interpretation of that Icarus image. There's a quick rise up, covering over a perfect fifth in a beat and a half, then the rest of the phrase is a slow, gentle glide back down to where we started. It's a soothing, encouraging melody matching up perfectly with the lyrics. Carry on, my wayward son. There'll be peace when you are done. For the final line, they switch it up. The band drops out and we get our acapella singing again with a new contour. Don't you cry no more! While the other three lines were all calm and comforting, they didn't end on the one chord, so they still had some instability. Here we finally wrap things up with a nice solid return to the root, communicating the clear sense of finality we've been waiting for this entire time. We're finally home. From there we get the first riff again, then some more vocal sections, and then we're into the bridge with some brand new riffs. First there's this one. <laughs> where we get blasted by 16th notes. Outside the triplet section, the rhythms have mostly stuck to 8th notes, with just the occasional 16th creeping in for decoration, but here they've become a central rhythmic feature with a rapid walk down the entire minor pentatonic scale. Faster rhythms are obviously more exciting, so the sudden appearance of a new subdivision says we've just gotten to the fun part. As soon as we get to the bottom, it switches gears again, slowing down to 8th notes as we bounce back up to D, and then it starts syncopating, hitting every offbeat 8th note. The notes themselves are, again, minor pentatonic, but that's fine. Good riff writing is all about balance. The rhythm here is demanding so much attention that adding fancy notes on top of it would wind up being distracting. Better to stick to a simple scale like minor pentatonic where all the notes just work and the rhythm has the space to shine. The only thing I really need to highlight in the notes is the ending. Half the time they do the thing I just played, where they slide from D down to C. Well, in the other half, they just hang on D for the rest of the bar. C is a fairly stable point in the key, while D isn't, so alternating between the two ending notes gives us this seesaw effect between closure and momentum. The next riff takes that syncopation idea and cranks it up to 11, with almost every attack occurring on an offbeat eighth note. Using the same rhythmic concept ties the two riffs together so they make sense as a single section, but all the details are different. Removing the sixteenth note run makes it feel less frantic, while leaning harder on the syncopation makes it more intense. And to really hammer that point home, they syncopate the last note even more, playing it a sixteenth note early. If I push it back to the offbeat eighth, I think it's a lot less exciting. Before we get to the second half of the riff, I want to talk about note choices. Much like the second riff in the intro, we've shifted tonal centers, building our walk down on E with a similar effect. This time though, it's not just E minor pentatonic. No, on the third beat, we hear C sharp, which is a very unusual note in A minor. In E though, it's not that hard to explain. Remember the F sharp in the first riff, the major sixth that decorated the minor scale to lift it up a bit? Yeah, well, C sharp is the major sixth in E, so I read this as a callback to that. We've moved it into a new tonal context, but it's the same device. That new context puts us on a note that on paper is pretty hard to justify in our home key, but that's the thing about analysis. It's not about how it looks, it's about how it sounds, and because of this underlying musical vocabulary, it sounds like it fits perfectly. It's interesting though, the vocal melody seems perfectly happy to use minor sixths, but whenever the riffs break from minor pentatonic, it's with a major sixth. They don't tend to happen near each other, so there's not really a clash between them, but they give the two parts different emotional characters. Anyway, the second time they play a different ending, where they do that D to F sharp drop from the main riff, then start walking up in half steps toward A. This turns the C sharp into like a sort of foreshadowing. It reminded us of the major sixth thing, so that when we suddenly heard an F sharp, we knew it was pulling us back to A. But we don't quite make it. After the G sharp, we pop up to C natural, delaying the resolution and contrasting with the C sharp from earlier to clearly reestablish us in A minor. So yeah, that C sharp is doing a lot of work. After a couple solos, we return to the main riff to reset, and then we hear this. crashing through with some big, punchy stop time chords using that same 1-4 accent pattern. This is basically the verse progression, but the dramatic delivery makes it feel entirely different. Now, instead of a sedate, drifting line, you feel each new chord hitting you like a truck. The gaps between chords are filled by Walsh belting out some incredible high notes. Carry on! You will and importantly, he is mostly singing alone. Steinhardt harmonizes the carry on, but the rest is just Walsh, drawing a stark contrast between this and the rich, blended choruses. While the choruses are encouraging you from the outside, here the defiance feels like it's coming from within. In the second half, they drop the stop time, switching back to arpeggios like a normal verse, but with Walsh still sitting on those high notes to keep the energy up. Next, there's another chorus, then we suddenly shift to the triplet riff from the intro. It's the first time we've heard this since the beginning of the song, and it's the first time we've entered it from somewhere other than the main riff, 
life. So even though we've heard it before, the new groove still feels like it comes out of nowhere one last twist before the song ends. But we're not actually done yet. Once we settle into that triplet groove again, they throw another curveball because it turns out there's another riff they've been saving until the very end. <laughs> Here we continue the triplet groove, but now it's centered on F-sharp, which... Okay, I'm sure some of you rolled your eyes when I made such a big deal about this note in the main riff, but look at this. At the end, with the narrative resolved, we get this new riff with a new center, and that center just happens to be the note they've been using to break out a minor pentatonic the whole time? That's awesome. Note-wise, this is itself mostly F-sharp minor pentatonic. The first bar is on F-sharp, then we do this pentatonic trill, playing power chords on the notes above and below the root before returning. Those two neighboring notes happen to be A and E, the centers of our previous riffs and the most important notes in our home key, so recontextualizing them as ornamentations and circling our new root is a really powerful effect. But more than notes, the exciting thing here is the rhythm. In a triplet groove, the standard approach is to accent the first and third notes in each beat. We saw this in our previous triplet riff and we get it in the first bar here, but when they hit those other chords, they're on the second note. The effect is kinda like 16th note syncopation, with the emphasis being pulled in between the expected cracks, but with triplets. It's a really unexpected, exciting pattern, adding yet another cool rhythmic idea just when you thought the song was over. And that's pretty much it. They go back and forth between those two riffs for a while, then end with this. hanging on an F major chord and leaving the door open for further exploration. This same figure set up the very first verse, so it's not so much a conclusion as it is an invitation to write your own ending. To keep moving, rise above the noise and confusion, and above all, to carry on. Anyway, thanks for watching. As always, this song was chosen by my patrons on Patreon. The poll to pick the next one goes up over there next week. Oh, and don't forget to like, share, comment, subscribe, and above all, keep on rockin'.